Game, the show for gamers by gamers. I'm Hex. And I'm Bajo. This week on the show, we get drenched in a digital downpour as we review Heavy Rain. Hell gets a vacuuming as we check out the demon-slaying temptations of Dante's Inferno. We also go backwards compatible to see what's up with Was It, the tried and true FPS gaming config. And we stop off at Game Jam Sydney to meet some Aussie designers who have less than 48 hours to make an original game to a mystery brief. The results are seriously amazing, Badge. But first, can you identify this nugget of retro gaming gold? That was so disturbing, I think we need some news to calm everybody down, heck. <laughs> <sighs> These chairs are cool. Good game. Disaster at Activision. The global publisher has decided to cut back on the production of Guitar Hero games and has made drastic cutbacks as a result. Around 90 staff have been let go from Radical Entertainment, the home of Prototype, and Neversoft is also feeling the pinch, reducing its staff by 50. But it gets worse. Three Activision-owned studios, Red Octane, Underground Development, formerly Z-Axis, and Luxaflux, have been shut down completely. Some staff from Red Octane kept their jobs and were merged with Neversoft, but the vast majority of the game designers, coders and artists at these terminated studios are now on the breadline. Bad news, PC gamers. The Windows version of Alan Wake has been cancelled. This long-awaited survival horror title will now be an Xbox 360 exclusive. Explaining the move, a Microsoft representative remarked that Alan Wake was unsuitable for the intimacy of the PC gaming experience. We ultimately realised that the most compelling way to experience Alan Wake was on the Xbox 360 platform, so we focused on making it an Xbox 360 exclusive. A Queensland software pirate has copped a mega fine for his cybernetic larceny, Grand Theft Data. 24-year-old Brisbane man James Burt was busted for uploading files from New Super Mario Bros. Wii to the internet a full week before the game actually went on sale. Nintendo has been able to prove that those very files were then subsequently hacked and downloaded a good 50,000 times. Nintendo was not pleased. The federal court has now ordered Mr. Burt to pay the Japanese game company $1.5 million in damages, plus a further $100,000 in legal costs. Good game. Well, when a fad hits, it hits hard. And right now, it's all about demon slaying your way through an apocalyptic hell. And Dante's Inferno is no exception. It's so hot right now. You play as Dante himself, fresh and bloodied from the holy wars, only to come home and find your wife's dead, half-naked body on your doorstep with a sword sticking out of her belly. And what's worse, her soul now belongs to Lucifer. Out! Beatrice! I have to go with him, my love. I gave my word. Turns out she made the unfortunate wager that Dante would be faithful while he was at war. So I guess fidelity wasn't Dante's strong suit because he now has to fight his way through the bowels of hell to try and save her soul. But not before a quick battle with death to steal his sight. You are now adequately equipped to battle the denizens of the underworld. Armed with a scythe, you now have the ability to punish or absolve your enemies, and the souls you collect from either action will determine your path as a holy or unholy warrior. And, of course, the abilities you'll develop as a result. Starting in Limbo, you work your way through seven levels of hell, each with their own grotesque themed of deadly sin. I really like this concept, Hex. Every level has its own unique design and enemies, and it just kept me wondering what's coming around the corner. I agree, the concept was really impressive, but it sort of ends there for me. I mean, let's not beat around the bush. This game basically is just God of War. You there, stand aside from those that are dead. From the art and design, the combat, the boss fights, the puzzles, I felt like I'd done it all before. And it had one of my pet hates, a fixed camera. I hate that. Yeah, it, it is very similar. I think I'm in two minds about it because I really like God of War and also this is multi-platform, so anyone who hasn't been able to play God of War might get a chance to play something now that's very similar. Unless they've already played Darksiders. Yeah. Uh, as for the fixed camera, though, I do think God of War developed that camera in a much more thoughtful way, and here they've just kind of copied that without that same thought behind it. Oh, it's just so restrictive. You know, I want to look that way and I can't look that way because the right stick is now a dash and I end up dashing around in frustration. It's annoying. 
As you go about collecting souls, you pick up abilities and special magic attacks, which of course require mana to use. But luckily, there's plenty of mana boxes. I mean, chests. I mean, fountains to keep you replenished. Death's Scythe allows you to perform basic combos and spinning attacks, which also reminded us of Darksiders. Yes, Dante's Holy Cross erupts with bursts of light and acts as a pretty good ranged weapon. There's also quick time events for the finishes, but it's nothing we haven't seen before, even though they are kind of impressive. If all this is giving you a serious case of deja vu, well, we're not surprised. Bajo, there's no denying that the previous games in this genre have been outstanding, but is the answer then to create a slew of games exactly the same to saturate the market? Imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, and with God of War so successful, we're bound to see clones of it popping up all over the place. I don't mind it. If the formula works and there's enough different for me to stay in the game, then I will play it. Yeah, I mean, I hear what you're saying, but I feel like if you're going to follow a game's formula to the letter, you need to have one seriously epic element to set it apart, and Dante's Inferno just didn't have that for me. Didn't the level design do it for you? It did it for me. Ah, yes, the level design. Devs really went out of their way to make hell the most grotesque, vile place that anyone could possibly play their way through. You'll encounter some of the most nasty creatures on your journey. Could I have done without the giant lady demon boobs with gaping nipples that spewed forth tiny babies with swords for arms that then tried to kill you with their sword arms? Maybe, but it is hell after all. I was so focused on solving a puzzle at one point that I didn't even realise I was standing next to this. I really enjoyed playing this game. It's challenging, thoroughly revolting, which has a certain appeal, but I mean, I'd done it all before. I wanted something to make me say, yeah, it's like God of War, but instead I was just saying, it's like God of War. It's a seven from me. I really enjoyed it. I just wish the combat had evolved. I felt like I was having the same fight over and over again in a whole new world of disgusting. I'm giving it seven and a half. Game Jam is a growing phenomenon around the globe and it's the first time that we've held this event here in Sydney. Uh, it's the first time we've held one in Australia, actually. It's 48 hours of intensive game creation. We've got 50 people here um, of a range of skills and backgrounds. It's an opportunity for people to get together and rapidly develop new ideas in a hothouse environment. The Game Jam is held concurrently in 138 locations around 38 countries. Everybody starts at 5pm in their time zone and goes for 48 hours over this weekend. There's a theme that everybody around the world has to build games based on. And the theme this year was deception. So all around the world people are making deception games. We've basically locked them in a room <laughs> for 48 hours and not let them out until they make a game. One reason to compete in the Game Jam is just like to have fun making a game and maybe get a shot at winning. But more than that, it's about building connections in the community. We're both programmers and game designers, uh, but we really suck at art. So being able to come here and meet potential, you know, lifelong connections who would want to team up with us and make games outside of this event, that's something that we really like doing. My game was called Tentacle and it was all about having these just like huge tentacles and you lure all these people in and then you sort of press space and your tentacles fly out and kill them all leaving this bloody mess on the screen. The gameplay was actually quite different to how we thought it would be from the beginning. Like we wanted to have this sort of stealth thing and luring people away but it just ended up being like getting as many people and killing them all at once. My game is called Snowfall. We had a really cool idea and concept and we put quite a lot of time into creating the engine and to make sure it was possible. And then once we had played it, it wasn't as fun as we'd hoped, but yeah, it was still fun to make it. I think it's the only time I've actually stayed up a whole two days. I think I had maybe three hours bad sleep on the floor last night. 
we were really lucky that we had a couple of cases of energy drink to keep us awake the whole night because otherwise we would have just been sitting in front of the keyboard, you know, passed out. I mean, it was fun, but I'm really looking forward to getting home, so. And we'll sleep well tonight, yep. that's for sure. <laughs> I think what really keeps them going is just the love for what they're doing. The games are looking really polished and have some really interesting gameplay. There are some ideas there that I've not seen ever done before. I'm really looking forward to the, the playtesting time when we actually get to get our hands on the games and play them. This is actually a multiplayer game, so we can have four people at once in the game. So what you're seeing here is our main character. Is he modelled on you? Uh, oh, yes, yeah, actually. Similar. You have a nice 80s reference in there. I think I saw a Rubik's we Cube. Do you have one or two? Would the judges like to come on and, uh, and tell us their decision? The most original gameplay idea. One game where we all agreed on this one was, was pretty cool and pretty awesome, and we you know, thought it was amazing is Nilly. Most yeah. original gameplay idea. Yeah. Come on up. We've got some enemies. Um, I can kill them by being angry at them. They die faster as the angrier I am, so... DIE! <laughs> the most intuitive control. We thought it looked very simple and easy to play was Snowfall. You are a cloud and you have to snow on the Wolfenstein-style Nazis who come down from the top. <laughs> The big one for best overall game. The winner is Tentacle. Yay! Yeah, I didn't see it coming as well, just because, like, when you're making something, you spend so much time working on it, you can't really, in the end, see how other people are going to see it. But yeah, it was really well. I think it translated quite well to the big screen, which was good. Easy to understand. Kill yeah, things. Exactly. It wasn't. It wasn't a very deep game, but it was lots <laughs> of fun. From the arcade joystick to the waggle of a Wii remote, game controllers have continued to evolve with each new generation of hardware. The PC, on the other hand, has happily been going strong for decades with the tried and true combination of keyboard and mouse, specifically that little cluster of keys, W-A-S-N-D, or WASD. There was a time when the arrow keys were king. First-person shooters in the early 90s had those four lonely arrows bound to play a movement for the player's right hand, with the left hand free to explore the various combinations of control, alt, shift and spacebar for actions like shoot, run, reload, strafe and jump. The keyboard was all you needed to dispatch the endless hellspawn. It was when PC shooters first allowed us to look up and down that the arrow key method began to show its weaknesses. Players had to suddenly take their right hand off the movement keys in order to adjust the view of the 3D world, usually by tapping page up and page down. Those arrow keys were just a little too isolated for their own good. It soon made sense for developers to start incorporating full mouse control. Quake 1 gave players a mouse look option, which had to be manually activated by typing plus M look into the console. With the right hand equipped to control both the camera view and shoot button, player movement was moved on to the left hand side of the keyboard for ergonomic reasons. The furthest comfortable position was Wazard, as the pinky could sit on the shift key, commonly used for sprint, while the thumb rested on the space bar, which was most often used for jumping. You could also quickly access the number keys along the top of the keyboard to switch weapons and use keys like E or F to use items or operate switches. Thanks to the humble mouse, we now have true Twitch gameplay, something that would elevate Quake's multiplayer to a whole new level of hardcore gaming. In fact, pro gamer Thresh used the Wazard setup to great success in a series of Quake 1 tournaments, which helped promote the superiority of this new configuration to the drooling masses. 
However, while it popularised the Wazard config, Quake 1 wasn't actually the first game to offer it as a control solution. Over a year earlier, in 1994, Bungie Studios launched Marathon exclusively on the Apple Mac with full mouse look support, which did tend to expose the enemies in the game as the flat 2D sprites they really were. The FPS Terminator Future Shock also included a free look option, though curiously banishing the left hand to the A, Shift, Z and X keys as the default for movement. Ugh. Going back even further into the 80s, occasionally players would have the opportunity to sit at the same keyboard and battle it out on the one screen. This put one player on the arrow keys and the other on the wazard keys, or sometimes W, A, S and Z for an aesthetically pleasing diamond shape. So really, the W, A, S and D keys have been important to PC gamers for a lot longer than you may think. Despite compatibility with USB pads like the Xbox 360 controller, the PC looks set to rely on the wazard and mouse combo setup for some time yet. Probably be uh, in television, in another form of entertainment. You know, I, any way that I can, you know, make people smile. <laughs> <laughs> One more step, and it'll be your last. <laughs> I used to be a, a magician. I worked at a nightclub in Hollywood called Wizards, which is in Universal City Walk, and I also uh, performed at the Magic Castle in Hollywood. And. Uh, that was fun. I mean, it was really cool because your relationship with your audience is immediate. Like, you're doing something and you can see the reactions in real time and you can adjust your performance. However, with video games, we can reach millions of people. So that's kind of cool. But it's the same thing. It's actually, you know, smoke and mirrors. It's uh, an illusion to create a sense of a reality that isn't true, in fact. Is there no end to my power? From the makers of Fahrenheit comes Heavy Rain, an ambitious interactive movie with twisting storyline, stunning motion capture and a beautiful soundtrack, and it'll do its best to rip your heart out. This game is very easily spoiled, so we're going to do the best we can not to ruin anything for you, but if you are sensitive to such things, now's the time to plug your ears and your eyes, and don't leave the room though, we like you, stay. The origami killer is kidnapping children and murdering them. No! Four individuals set out to find and rescue a stolen boy before it's too late. You'll play a hardened PI right out of film noir, a young FBI agent with some fancy futuristic glasses, a foxy reporter and a kidnapped boy's father, an architect who, despite his good intentions, is generally just a terrible dad. Leave me alone! I hate you! You spend plenty of time wandering around, searching for clues and interacting in the world in a very unique way with quick time events and it's, it's a very different way to game. Yeah, but it's not really as painful as it sounds though. I mean, you just have to be open to it and after a while you learn the game's language and there were really only like one or two moments when I was annoyed by a repetitive task. It is a bit strange that you can fail at brushing your teeth or showering a man So I don't think the game will appeal to everyone based solely on that, on the quick time events, not showering a man. Um, but you know, in many ways, it's a natural evolution of the action adventure game, just more cinematic, and it's got a dynamic path too. So everybody's story is slightly different. Tell me what you need. There are unique and multiple endings to the game and also to each scene, depending on how well you did with the quick time events or which path you choose. And sometimes you actually choose to fail the quick time events on purpose because that makes the scene go in a different direction or and it's not always a bad thing. And it's really fun making these choices in your mind saying, no, I'm going to fail this bit to see what happens. Yeah, it sort of makes the player a bit of a, a director of sorts and you can choose the kind of emotions that you want your character to convey and some of those decisions are really kind of tough. Yeah, punk, please. I'm gonna, please, please don't kill me, man. I got children. 
my girl, see? Get out. This one, Sarah. And go thy somewhere else. That's Cindy. Please, man. I want to see them again. Please. Please don't shoot. <laughs> I'm a father too. There are some situations where you don't even have time to make a considered choice. Mm. But I think the best sequences are the ones that play memory games on you. You know, you'll find yourself thinking back to a part in the game where you were focused on a, a time on a clock or an object in the background because it was framed in a certain way, but it's not always obvious. Brown pants. This is a very adult game with high definition nudity and strong adult themes such as home invasion and suicide. There's some very, very dark characters and moments in the game and they'll definitely shock some people. Foxy Reporter is definitely there for the sex appeal, but it's not in a... I didn't find it in a gratuitous Michael Bay bollocks way. It was just adult. Although the makeout scene is definitely the creepiest moment I've ever had in a game. <laughs> But with that exception, the motion capture is actually quite interesting to watch. For the most part, the models don't actually creep you out. Yeah, it is a joy to watch. And the story tries to play with your emotions, with the music and the narrative. And for them, and at first it didn't really work. I wasn't buying it, Hex. What's up? It's Merlin. He's dead. He's dead and it's all my fault. <laughs> I'd give anything if you could come back to life. This all changes after 20 minutes, though, in a big way. And, Hex, it's so rare for a game to make you feel anything in such a short space of time. Yeah, there are some really standout sequences, though it's not technically flawless. Moving your character around in the world can sometimes be quite fiddly, thanks to the old fixed camera problem. Fixed camera failed twice in one episode. As far as the bigger picture goes, I had issues with the way the game really cheats you in order to tell its story. For example, there are times when your character's internal monologue will give you the chance to accept or refuse to do something, but then the game will force you to choose accept as the final option anyway. It was like a big middle finger to me as the player. See, I, I didn't mind it so much. I thought it more as a, uh, as a way to play out your character's thought process, and it was fun making that decision in my mind anyway, regardless of whether it would actually change the outcome of that scene. I have no choice. Yeah, but the player is having no influence in what's happening a lot of the time. I feel like you're just pushing cutscenes along. There may as well just be a big pause and play button. For example, if you don't, say, feed the baby some milk, the game will just loop you until you perform that task. You don't have the option to do it or not do it. Oh, Emily, are you hungry? Yeah, that baby scene is probably where the game is at its weakest, and it's a good example of that. You, your instincts tell you to feed this baby, but you can't do it until you go off and do something else, and that doesn't make sense. But, I don't know, the, the visuals pulled me through, and the story pulled me through that, even though you're just going through the motions. And there are those big moments where you have to make a choice and like whether to hurt someone or not, and I think the game redeems itself in those bits. Well, there should have been more of that and less of the other. Like, I was compelled to stay in the game because I wanted to find out who the origami killer was, but when I did find out, the reveal was kind of disappointing when I realised that the game had almost outright lied to me to stop me from finding out who it was before the game wanted me to. There are also some plot holes and, you know, moments that are unexplained that you're just forced to accept. Yeah, I, it does force you to eat some red herrings at times and I agree that is completely unfair. We've explored heaps of options with this game, we finished it twice and we once with all the characters solving the crime and once with none of them solving it and it's, the best part is actually talking with someone who's finished it and discussing the pivotal moments where things changed and what they did and seeing how all the characters interweave at the end and, and that's a, a very good thing that that is in the game. I did like how if your character fails or dies they're just out of the game completely. It's a really different game. It's it's not even like you're playing a game. It's like being part of a weird, long movie. And I guess the fact that we enjoyed talking about the end so much is a good thing. It's about being part of a story. And I was engaged enough to stay until the end, despite those little deceptive bits. I'm giving it 7.5 out of 10. I'm glad they didn't solve every problem with a magic matrix thing like in Fahrenheit. I think it might be a symptom of such a, a big and different game with so many branching storylines that these little inconsistencies and contradictions are there. It's just a shame they didn't iron them out because it's such a clever script with beautiful visuals to boot. I'm giving it eight and a half out of ten rubber chickens. To boot?
Last week we said we'd check out the multiplayer for Bioshock 2 and Hex, you had pretty high expectations for it. What do you think? Yeah, it was okay. I mean, you know, I was so excited to go into those worlds and, and play against other people other than just fish. But when I did get in there with other players, I found that the maps were actually quite small. Yeah, they were small and it was just boring. I, I didn't want to have to unlock all these weapons because it just wasn't fun enough to go through all that. I did like some of the hacking and research ideas behind it, but ultimately it was a bit meh really all around. I don't see myself going back there anytime soon. <sighs> So, did you guess the admittedly creepy game for this week? It was Seven Sins, which released on PC and PS2 in 2005. The Sims-like game involves interacting with a variety of characters to explore the seven deadly sins. Some of the awfully crass minigames include beer drinking and find the G-spot. Right, massive action game next week, or mag, but does more players equal more fun? And ahead of the release of Unlucky For Some number 13, we'll be featuring the Final Fantasy series in an epic backwards compatible. You can catch Good Games Spawn Point over on ABC3 on Saturday night from 7.25, or you can watch it as well as Good Game on iView or from our website. Don't forget we're on Twitter and Facebook as well. You know, Facebook's over 9,000? Over 9,000. Mm. Till next week, gamers, Bajo out. Hex out. <laughs> Oh, God.